Hello again, and welcome to Kabbalah Revealed. I'm Tony Kozenek. In our last lesson, we learned about the screen, Masach, the primary tool of attainment in the method of Kabbalah. And just to sum it up quickly, uh, the screen is an intention to receive in order to bestow to the Creator. That is, that we create, the creature creates in itself a, a quality, a similar quality to the quality that surrounds it, an inner quality that has a similarity of form, an equivalence of form, with the, the property, the attribute of bestowal outside of it. That is, its act of receiving becomes an act of giving. And we also learned that all motion in, in the higher reality, in the spiritual worlds, happens only as a result of this law of equivalence of form. Now, we could imagine that this law of equivalence of form is some kind of mystical or magical thing, some kind of, uh, of an innovation, a novelty. But it's not just something that was made up by the sages of Kabbalah. It really is a principle, a law that governs the whole universe, everything that we see. It exists in nature. It's simply that the sages are pointing out to us that this is the method by which we develop, we grow, we move, and can attain uh, the goal of creation. In this lesson, we're going to look a little more closely at the law of equivalence of form. Uh, we'll do that by looking at an article written uh, by Bala Salam. It's a piece of an article, actually. It comes from Matan Torah, or the giving of Torah, the giving of instruction by the light. Uh, and it's a section of it called The Acting Intelligence. What the Kabbalist said, that every person is obligated to comprehend the root of his soul, means that the creature's purpose, most desired and full of hope, is bonding with the Creator, as in the verse, and to bond with Him. And the sages interpret this as bonding with His attributes, just as He is compassionate, so you, and so on. He says here, every person is obligated to comprehend the root of his soul. In other words, it's not just that somebody makes a decision that they will bond with the root of their soul, it's that the entire system consists of a, of a motion coming from the thought of creation which moves a person to the point where they will comprehend the root of their soul. And the way in which the thought of creation, which is to create a creature and fill it with delight, the way it functions in the universe and in creation is expressed through the law of equivalence of form. That is, that all of nature works on this law. That there is a constant pressure in our environment and in every environment in the universe and there is a constant force to equalize the inner pressure with the outer pressure and to come to a state of balance with it so that we come to a state of rest or comfort. And this is simply the law that is functioning all the time. You could think of Kabbalah as the physics of the spiritual world. And so it points this out to us so that we can begin to perceive it and, and to work with it. But this law functions in the natural universe as well. And we can look at it through natural sciences. For instance, astrophysicists tell us that the material universe was initiated by a huge explosion, the Big Bang. And from that point forward, all action within the universe is really a kind of an equalization of this force until it will find uh, a state that is motionless. So all forces uh, in the universe are working in such a way as to come into a balanced state. Now, in our world, this law is observed strictly, and we can see it on different levels uh, of life, the different levels that exist in our world. For instance, in the inanimate level, we see that there is 
uh, a movement of forces, tectonic plates, or the, mo the motion of, uh, of weather, wind, and water, constantly seeking a kind of a, of a balanced state with each other. And we see also the uh, vegetative level obeys this law by uh, absorbing things that it needs from, from light, which is outside of itself through a kind of photoelectric process, chemical process, or the, the movement of, uh, of minerals through it uh, with a kind of uh, an equalization of hydraulic forces that will move it through its stem and through its leaves. Uh, in the animate level, animals, you'll see movement of animals to uh, areas where there's food and, uh, and all of the appropriate things for their survival. If external uh, forces and conditions change, there's a constant shifting so that they come into alignment with it. But on the human level, we don't keep this law of equivalence of form because we don't live in an environment like the environment of the inanimate vegetative and animate level. These are already taken care of. These things are already perfected. They already work according to this law. And the human level, uh, we are up against laws that we have no sense of, and we don't know how to observe these laws. So the human level which is not the uh, sort of intellectual and physical human animal, but the part of, uh, of creation itself that is supposed to be connected to the upper forces, is not involved in the keeping of these physical expressions of equivalence of form, but must learn how to keep the law of equivalence of form in the spiritual world, which is its environment. Let's look at the environment that we actually do live in. The world that surrounds the human level is based on exactly the same principle of nature, but it's a completely different order of nature because the human level is a level of feeling, thoughts, and intentions. And there are laws and forces that work on us that are of that nature. So here is the environment that we find ourselves in. There is a field of influence, and this field of influence is called the creator. The creator influences us by means of forces. And these forces are expressed as laws. That is, they're obligatory. They come to us from the creator, and each one of these is one of 613 forces or laws. These laws are laws of love. They are laws of bestowal. They are intentions towards the creature. Here in that field is the creature, plus the other levels of life below the creature, uh, levels 1, 2, and 3 that we spoke of earlier. Within the creature, there exist uh, like pressure or forces that must equalize with the influence coming from the creator. And these are called desires. There are 613 desires within the creature, the human level of the creature. And the law of equivalence of form means that the inner desire or pressure must equalize, that is, come to equivalence, form a balance with this desire that is related to this force from the Creator. And to the degree that we are unlike the forces, the 613 actual laws of nature for the human level, to the degree that we are not like it, we and all the levels of life below us suffer. Things go for the worse. To the degree that we equalize, that we succeed in finding equivalence of form and becoming the same thing as the intent behind that law, 
all of life, including the creature itself, finds a homeostasis, man, the human level, finds a homeostasis within this field and achieves equivalence with it, becomes like all of the 613 laws. Now, all of these laws that affect both the levels of life below us and the ones in relation to the man, if, if the creature can equalize with that, with the law of nature, he is also equalizing with the Creator himself. Because the Kabbalists tell us that the, the value in gematria between the word for nature, teva in Hebrew, and the word for God, Elohim, is 86, meaning they are the same thing. They apply both to the level of human and to every other level below man. Now, this may seem mechanical. It's a kind of mechanical explanation. But since we, as humans, don't really feel how our inner states affect the levels of life below us, um, nor really do we have to, all we need to be aware of is our feeling states and how they work in our relationship to the world around us, that is, to people around us, to situations, the situations of our life. And that's what the equalization of the inner pressure of the desire and the outer pressure of a law is really about. Uh, we learned that in the story of the guest and the host that the way in which we can perceive what these laws are and to equalize with them is to be concerned not with the gift, that is, the event itself, but with the giver. What is the thought? behind the event and the circumstances that we find ourselves in at any given time and what is our attitude towards that. It seems like a very difficult thing to do, but that process of how we can sense that already exists in nature and we merely have to learn to observe that, how that operates and to do it. Now, let's return to the article, The Acting Intelligence by Bala Salam. And as we read this, try to connect to the author's thought and to his feeling, but especially try to connect to the thought and feeling behind why he is expressing this to you. The Acting Intelligence. I will explain by way of an illustration. We observe that in every deed performed in the world, there adheres and remains in that deed the very mind which performed it, so that in the table we sense the mindful craft of the carpenter and his command of his craft, whether great or small. For at the time of his work, he evaluated it with his knowledge and intelligence, so that one who examines that deed and thinks about the mind concealed therein realizes that it is from its inception bound up with the mind that made it. That is, they are, in fact, unified. We can see in everything that appears in this world that there is a thought behind it. It simply doesn't arise out of nothing. There is, in the world that we see before us, definitely craftsmen behind the objects. And we know from this physical example that the intention, that is the quality of the work, the care, uh, what it is that, that was intended for our use, can be felt even in the simplest things. It's what we call quality. It is a sensation, not that this is an expensive or simply a beautiful object, but that if you really look at it, 
what you are sensing is the intention behind that thing. The quality of the mind, the quality of the desire to give an object or a circumstance of beauty to us. And we may look at a physical object and um, perhaps we will be blinded by its opaque quality. But to the degree that we desire to feel and know and become like that thing behind it, that is, I want to know what my friend's experience was. I want to know what the artist meant by this. I want to feel the message that is really intended in this. If I just take the object as it is, I can't understand anything. But if I look at the object, I can feel the mind of the artist, of the craftsman. Now, I'm skipping here. And he goes on to say, and therefore when someone thinks about his friend's performance and he comprehends the intelligence that he exercised in that performance, then both are equally involved in one power and intelligence. They are now in fact unified like a man who chances upon his beloved friend in the market and embraces and kisses him and to draw them apart is impossible on account of the great bond between them. In other words, if the person who perceives this thought behind the giving is in contact with the thought, he is in contact with precisely the same point of origin out of which the object and the intention behind it emerged. And he's bonded with his friend behind the object, behind the event. That is, ah, I understand what the artist meant by this. I feel the idea conveyed to me, not at a distance, but I'm bonded with that idea. I am one with the mind of the one who intended it. And therefore, generally speaking, that aspect of intelligence of which we speak is the power and the intelligence which is found between the creator and the creatures. It is the intermediary between the creator and the creature. That is, he emanated one spark of intelligence by which all returns to him. All these things that are presented to us as physical occurrences, as inner feelings, um, as sensations, as desires, as fulfillments, all of these things that appear to be outside of us is are actually the mind of the Creator, that is, the thought of the Creator, conveyed to us on the level on which we can accept it. And if our desire is to understand why this was given, the quality of love behind what is given, then we bond with that intermediary. And the light, this is the intelligence emanating from the source. And recall the verse, all of them you made with wisdom. That is, he created the whole universe with his wisdom, that is, with this thought. And therefore, he who merits to comprehend the ways in which he created the universe and its order surely bonds with the intelligence of him who caused them, and thus he bonds with the blessed creator. The acts of the creator are not the physical things. Remember, the environment that the human lives in is not the environment of physical acts, which is already perfectly in balance with the laws of nature. The environment of the human is the thought of the Creator. And this is what a person can connect with. They can connect with the cause. And the bonding with it is simply to enter into the same thought and the same intention. Once this begins to happen, we are no longer separated um, in an external world, in a physical world, but we are connected with that point that emanates everything into this world. And this is done through a relationship with the Creator. It's like uh, a relationship with, um, with a lover, with a beloved, in the sense that when you uh, love somebody, you, you want them to know who you are. You, send, you write them little notes. You show them what you enjoy. You, you express your thought to them so that the bonding 
with your beloved will be on the level not simply of the physical, but beyond that, in the intangible place that we feel as love. So these constant events that evolve in our lives are like notes uh, of love, a beckoning on the part of the Creator to, to come to Him. And our desire to respond to that call is likewise from a, a place and a feeling to want to know our beloved in that way. And this is the secret of the Torah. It is that all the creations of the Creator that appertain to or can be comprehended by the creatures, that means everything that was created, every single expression that exists in creation is only the expression of the Creator and is aimed specifically at this call to the creature. It's all accessible to the creature. Every single bit of it is supposed to be known by the creature. In other words, the worlds were created for man. And with this, we understand why the Creator showed us the tool of His craft. Are we in need to create worlds? Rather, from what we said above, it is clear that the Creator showed us His orders so that we would know how to bond with Him, which is the fulfillment of to bond with His attributes. Why does an artist show us His work? It is so the, His perception, His inner feeling, and His attitude will be accessible to us. And though right now uh, we don't understand how worlds are created, through the connection with the thought of the Creator, we can rise to know all of His laws, all of the ways in which everything that we see before us comes about. That is, why it's there, for what purpose it's there. And this reciprocal sensation of thought and intention is the way in which the law of equivalence of form is expressed on the human level. It's the balance between the inner desire to, to know, to be filled with pleasure, and the actual pleasure that exists, the only pleasure that exists, which is the knowledge of the thought of the Creator. And this system is built perfectly to uh, create the desire that will allow a person to come into this balance. Join us again. Hello again, and welcome to Kabbalah Revealed. I'm Tony Kozenek. In this lesson, we're going to look closely at a Kabbalistic article, something that we looked at uh, a few lessons ago, but we're going to look at it in more detail. It's an article called There's none else beside him. This article comes from a book called Shemati. Shemati means I have heard. And these articles were lessons spoken by Bala Salam to his students. And his son, uh, Rabash, uh, Rav Baruch Shalom Halevi Ashlag, was one of his students. And he wrote what his father said and he kept it in a in a little personal notebook and it was something this notebook was something that he kept with him all the time he had a, a few uh, books that he constantly referred to and this the directions the instructions and the the words of his father he kept close to him Rav uh, Michael Lightman, who is my teacher and the teacher of uh, B'nai Baruch, uh, was Rav Baruch's personal assistant. He took care of all of his, uh, his affairs and was with him all the time. And he was his direct disciple. And at the time, towards the end of, uh, of Rav Baruch's life, uh, Rav Lightman was with him. He was with him in the hospital. He was with him during that process. And during the time that he had studied with him, 
Rabash had shown him m many texts that he hadn't seen before and that hadn't been shared with uh, some of the other students. And Rob was aware of this notebook, uh, and he had, he had seen it and had uh, borrowed it occasionally to, to learn from and so on, and it was a very precious uh, thing. And when Rabash was on his deathbed, he gave this book to Rav Lightman. And uh, Michael Lightman published the book. And it contains beautiful uh, articles describing the inner work of a person. A lot of the, the work in Kabbalah is technical work. The study of, uh, of the Ten Sefirot, Talmud Esser Sefirot, and other technical works, the Tree of Life, um, uh, the Zohar, which deal with the technical aspects of creation as well as the inner states related to them. Well, these articles in the book Shemadi, uh, they're specifically made for the student to, to find himself, uh, to identify inner states and to connect these inner states to the, to the technical work and the Kabbalistic work as a whole. And they contain thought from the highest level of reality. This particular article, There's None Else Beside Him, it encapsulates the entire methodology of Kabbalah. There isn't anything that a person need do or know or consider that's not in this article. And uh, Rabash told Rav Lightman that uh, it would be a good thing if he read this hundreds of times. Uh, we'll read it once today, perhaps, if we can get through it. And uh, as we do, again, we're doing this only to attract upper light. And all that you need do as we go through this is to try to connect with the thought and the feeling of the author. There's none else beside him. It is written that there is none else beside him, meaning that there is no other power in the world with the ability to do anything against him. And what man sees, namely that there are things in the world which deny the household of above, is because he wills it so. In other words, there's one power, there is one active force, there is one actor in reality. And there is no other uh, authority, there is no other author to anything that occurs in reality. But the fact that we see that the world is built in such a way that there seems to be an opposing force, well, this is done on purpose. And it's for our benefit. And it needs to be harnessed, it needs to be understood, and it needs to be included in our perception. And it is deemed a correction called the left rejects and the right adducts, meaning that which the left rejects is considered correction. This means that there are things in the world which from the beginning aim to divert a person from the right way, and they reject them from holiness. The hiddenness of the Creator is not a physical hiddenness we feel Perhaps he's not there, or maybe I believe in him, but the proof for it, we don't truly claim that if, if we saw him stand before us, we already know this. We know that we're not speaking about a physical proof, a physical reality. The hiddenness of the Creator is hidden not just from our physical senses, it's he is hidden from our inner sensation, our feeling of connection, our, our faith, our direct sensation in our thoughts. It's, he is hidden from us by our doubts. Right? There's a quality of, of our inner state that when we are filled with doubt, then there is a rejection. That is, there's a hiddenness. We feel that it can't be so and that there is perhaps some other force. It's this sensation this inner state of hiddenness where the reason for things or to feel that there could be any kind of a divine guidance behind anything 
uh, our doubt covers it completely. This is the hiddenness of the Creator, and this is uh, His method of teaching us and bringing us along. This means that there are things in the world which from the beginning aim to divert a person from the right way, and they reject him from holiness. It's built that way. It's part of the design, this hiddenness of the Creator, and the evolution towards the desire to perceive the Creator. And the benefit from these rejections is that through them a person receives a need and a complete desire for God to help him. Since he sees it otherwise, he is lost. This need is actually what Kabbalah defines as prayer. To a Kabbalist, prayer is not words spoken. Uh, there, it's not something of the mouth. It's not the repetition of things, words, and ideas uh, in a prayer book. It is a gut-level need. It's something that has occurred in a person's desire uh, for which there can be no other answer but the thing desired for. And the hiddenness of the Creator and this action of the right and the left hand purposely create a need specifically for the closeness to the Creator, that is, for doubts to be removed, for us to rise above the aspect of our nature that engenders these doubts. Um, and that's the benefit. This is called uh, a, a correction, this development of this desire. And what is it that happens? How is this benefit felt for a person? Um, he's, not only does he not progress in the work, this is how he feels, but he sees that he regresses and he lacks the strength to observe Torah and mitzvot even if not for her name. So we know that the goal is to be able to be like the Creator, to create an inner similarity of form, of, of intention towards the Creator, which would be to bestow without thought of self, without that, that need, to be completely in bestowal, which is called for her sake or lishma. But a person can't even come close to that, so that the, the sensation that is teaching them and, and evolving them and building the need is a sensation that they can't even do this work, even if not for her name, that is, even for themselves they can't do it. The, the rejection and doubt is, is so uh, complete, and it's part of the process. It happens. It is one hand and then the next hand, one hand and the next. The, the, when this happens to a person, it's not, it, it's not happening because there's something wrong with the person. It's happening because it's in the system and it's built that way. That only by genuinely overcoming all the obstacles above reason, he can observe Torah and mitzvot. So this is the thing that's built for a person, that it's not possible by dealing with, with their, a doubt and then with some kind of a filling, a delight at feeling close. These two variations always produce a hiddenness, a sensation of hiddenness, and that the only way that a person can proceed to actually observe Torah and mitzvot, that is to become like the Creator, draw close and bond with the Creator, is above that level, above reason. But he doesn't always have the strength to overcome above reason, that otherwise he is forced to deviate, God forbid, from the way of the Creator, and even from not for her name. And he, who always feels that the shattered is greater than the whole, meaning that there are a lot more descents than ascents, and he doesn't see an end to these predicaments, and he will forever remain outside of holiness, for he sees that it's difficult for him to observe even as little as a jot unless through overcoming above reason, but he is not always able to overcome. And what shall be the end of it? This is the extent of the, the hiddenness and the need that it evokes in a person. It comes to an extreme expression, that is, the more that a person wants this, the more they truly desire this, the more it appears that they're pushed away. And this is a response uh, similar to the response of, uh, of a parent to a child who is, who is beginning to be an adult. You 
give them more room. You give them a kind of independence. You, you step away. And the, the, the depth of confusion of that uh, adolescent or the young, uh, young adult is, is an extreme situation. And it's done uh, as by a loving father towards a child. This extremity of, of distancing. And what shall be the end of it all? How is it even possible? Then he reaches the decision that no one can help him except God himself. And this causes him to make a heartfelt demand of the Creator to open his eyes and his heart and to bring him nearer to eternal adhesion with God. This is what eventually happens. A true prayer uh, appears within the person that you can't fool the Creator. You can't say one thing and really desire another. This is the kind of prayer that is answered immediately because the Creator is the whole of reality and the force of development responds to those particular conditions that allow for development. That is, there must be something in the creature that allows a higher state to occur for them. And that higher state only happens as a result of a deepening need. So it says, it follows then, that all the rejections that he had experienced had come from the Creator. That means that the rejections he experienced were not because he was at fault for not having the ability to overcome, but because these rejections are for those who truly want to draw nearer to God. And in order for such a person not to be satisfied with only a little, namely not to remain as a little child without knowledge, he receives help from above so that he won't be able to say, thank God he observes Torah and performs good deeds, and what else could he ask for? This action of the Creator, this rejection that was given to him, this doubt that entered him, was given to him by the Creator specifically so that he would not remain still, so that he wouldn't be satisfied with some sensation at a distance, some idea, some belief. In other words, that he wouldn't function as a child in reality. Oh, there is a God and he will take care of me and if I ask for something, maybe he'll change his attitude towards me and be nice to me and take away this situation. No, this is this is the way that a child um, tries to deal with and manipulate a parent. But what is it that a child can do uh, to a parent that would change the quality of the love towards the child? Even in the natural world, in the physical world, the love of a, of a mother or a father to the child, it encompasses everything for the child. There's nothing that will change it. It's constant. So for the person not to remain this way, would be not to be satisfied with this condition. That this force both of, uh, of drawing close and of pushing away is to evolve us into a spiritual adult. And only if that person has a true desire, he will receive help from above. So that's the condition. Only if a person has a true desire, of course there will be help from above. It's not that the Creator changed his attitude towards the person. It's that the person changed their need for the Creator. They, their desire, which is a vessel, opened a place in which perception of the Creator can occur, so it does occur. It's a law. It happens. The answer to the prayer depends totally on the, the change in attitude within the creature. And he is constantly shown how his faults in his present state, that is, he is sent thoughts and views which work against his efforts. And this is in order for him to see that he is not one with the Lord. In other words, this contrast of feeling rejection and thoughts of doubt, they're not his. They are an action of the Creator on him while he is becoming uh, a spiritual adult while he while he's growing and specifically the hiddenness comes f from uh, 
must be experienced as doubt and must go against his efforts, no matter how broad or how good or how precise he may have been progressing up until that point. It must undermine all of that purposely. And, and that is so that he can see a contrast between where he is now in, in a particular state and what he needs to overcome above reason, where he needs to be next. Because to be satisfied, you think, oh, I'm one with the Lord, I'm fine, I had, an, I had this perception, I'm okay, I know everything now, I've got some kind of belief on this level. No, the Creator wants to create a creature and fill it totally with a bonding, with, with the light. It has to be unbounded. So we have to see how unlike the next level we are so that we build this need again to move towards that level. And as much as he overcomes, he always sees how he is found in a position farther from holiness than others who feel one with the Lord. But he, on the other hand, always has complaints and demands, and he cannot justify the behavior of the Creator and how he behaves towards him. And it pains him that he is not one with the Lord until he comes to feel that he has no part in holiness whatsoever. So, a person sees his situation change. He's not satisfied with the things that others around him are satisfied with. He comes to a point of complete preparation, that is, of complete doubt and complete despair. This is one of the things that occurs. And this is a preparation. Um, it's a despair of, towards the goal, not a despair against life, that life is not worthwhile, but that according to the goal that that he has determined, his intention to bond with the Creator, he sees that it is completely beyond his capability, that is, the capability of his created nature and the will to receive, and his actions, his intelligence. It can't be done that way. And although he is occasionally awakened from above, which momentarily revives him, but soon he falls into an abyss. However, this is what causes him to realize that only God can help and really draw him closer. So, even the, the enlightenment, even the awakenings that he receives will not do the job. It must continue to the point where there is a complete need only for, for the Creator, only for the light. Uh, one has to really abandon this idea that there's something we can do with our actions in this world. No action by, by a person will do anything to advance this. Only the growing inner desire will change anything. A man must always try and cleave to the Creator, namely that all of his thoughts will be about him. And that is to say that even if he's in the worst state, from which there cannot be a greater descent, he should not leave his domain, namely think that there is another authority which prevents him from entering into holiness and which has the power to either benefit or harm. And that is the substance of doubt, that there's some other reason for, for this occurring. Either it's me or it is the world is conditioned in a certain way, my environment prevents me, that there is something other than the Creator doing all of these actions. That is, he must not think that there's a matter of the power of the other side, which does not allow a man to do good deeds and follow God's ways. But he should think that all is done by the Creator. The Baal Shem Tov said that he who says there is another power in the world, namely shells, is in a state of serving other gods, and that it's not necessarily the thought of heresy that is the sin, but if he thinks that there is another authority and a force apart from the Creator, by that he is committing a sin. that it's only the giving up of the goal of thinking that there is another power that draws a person away to, to make a decision that it is not only one force, it is not all the Creator. This distance is called sin. Furthermore, he who says that man has his own authority, 
meaning that he says that yesterday he himself did not want to follow God's ways, that too is considered to be committing the sin of heresy, meaning that he does not believe that only the Creator leads the world. All the thoughts that we have, all the feelings that we have, and all of the choices that we make based on those until we come to equivalence of form with the Creator, until we begin to sense spirituality, every single one of these things is placed in us. These are all actions of the Creator. Man has no authority in this, only his desire, only the growing of the vessel, specifically in a need for the light. This true prayer is the only action of man and the only thing necessary to ascend. We'll continue this article next time. Join us then. Hello again, and welcome to Kabbalah Revealed. I'm Tony Kozenek. In this lesson, we're going to continue with the article, There's None Else Beside Him, by Bala Salam. Now, this article contains the entire methodology of Kabbalah. All of the wisdom of Kabbalah is included in this article. And even though we're picking it up from paragraph 10, one of the qualities of Kabbalistic books is that even though it is a complete system uh, that, that takes a person end to end from their starting point in, in their will to receive and in their uh, condition of hiddenness from the Creator and reveals the whole of reality, the, the text speaks to a person uh, no matter where they are and at any point from the text. So it doesn't really matter where you enter, it just matters that you enter. And entering means that you, you try to feel the thought of the writer. You try to rise to his level and bring your desire to know spirituality and to enter it into the text. And then you'll be able to feel yourself and your condition and, and the text will speak to you where you are. So we're starting from Paragraph 10. A man must always try and cleave to the Creator, namely that all of his thoughts will be about Him. That is to say that even if he is in the worst state, from which there cannot be a greater descent, he should not leave his domain, namely think that there is another authority, which prevents him from entering into holiness and which has the power to either benefit or harm. This is the thing that the person must cling to, that every action that occurs, all of the positive things that occur and all of the things that seem to hide the sensation of the Creator from the person, that fill him with doubt and make him feel that the path to holiness uh, is blocked, that he should understand, that his, his thoughts should cleave to the Creator in that it, it's only the Creator that does these actions with him. There's only one actor in reality. And this is always the Creator, no matter what our doubt may speak in our ear, no matter what the will to receive may say, that there is some other factor, something in the person, something in his environment, some force working against the Creator that is causing this problem that a person should never leave their domain of the clinging to the Creator or the goal of why it is that they seek to bond with the Creator and listen to the, to the whispering of the, of the will to receive. Uh, the doubt is sent for a reason and it's sent from the Creator. That is, he must not think that there is the matter of the power of the other side which doesn't allow a man to do good deeds and to follow God's ways, but he should think that all is done by the Creator. The Baal Shem Tov said that he who says there is another power in the world, namely shells, is in a state of serving other gods. That it is not necessarily the thought of heresy that is the sin, but if he thinks that there is another authority and force apart from the Creator, by that he is committing a sin. And that is the definition of sin in Kabbalah. The thought, that is, the 
conviction uh, that there is anything but the Creator that is acting in this situation. Because the person must always strive to connect each event in life and their own inner sensations to the Creator. That everything, every action is happening as a result of a, the Creator's act and it is only the response of the creature which is his intention in regards to these. How it's evaluated that brings a person closer to the target or farther away from it. And that distance from the target, from attributing all of this to the Creator, the closeness is, is uh, you know, adherence to the way and the distance from it is considered to be a sin. Furthermore, he who says that man has his own authority, meaning that he says that yesterday he himself did not want to follow God's ways, that too is considered to be committing the sin of heresy, meaning that he does not believe that only the Creator leads the world. Even if a person thinks that their own actions, that their own thoughts and choices are their own, that what they sense as their own actually originates from them, it is as though the person is an authority against the Creator, which is not so. Even the desire to come to the Creator was placed in us by the Creator. Just as the, the left hand pushes away through the, the sending of doubts. Likewise, the right hand awakens a person and gives them the sensation that they are choosing to come to the Creator. It's not the action. It's not whether uh, we feel that we are being rejected by holiness or being drawn by it that is the issue for our progress. The whole point is to understand that it is our attitude towards what's occurring that will be the place in which our independence, our freedom, and our likeness with the Creator will appear and develop, not in the actions. And all of these things that, are, uh, that we consider to be external and internal are really an improper perception. All of this is actions by the Creator, and we are more or less in agreement with it. We more or less assign all of these to the Creator and want it to be that way. Enjoy and return that knowledge to the Creator. But when he's committed a sin, and he must surely regret it, and be sorry for having committed that sin, but here too, we should place the pain and the sorrow in the right order. Where does he place the cause of the sin? And what is the point that he should be sorry for? A man should then feel sorry and say, I committed a sin because the Creator hurled me down from holiness to a place of filth, to the lavatory where there is filth, and that is to say that God gave him a desire and a craving to amuse himself and breathe air in a place of stench. If a person feels that they made that choice themselves, that they're bad and they chose not to to move forward towards the Creator, that they wanted to satisfy their will to receive as opposed to progressing towards uh, developing uh, the will to bestow, that they messed up. This is also the thought that they have some kind of authority. The blame is not on the person. There is no blame. There is no responsibility in the action. The responsibility is in the intention. And this is not to say that people go around doing actions that we know from our society are illegal, etc. We're talking about an inner state. We're talking about a movement within a person to experience something for themselves as opposed to, to maintaining the desire to bestow. But the desire to move in either direction is given by the Creator. The fault is not with the person. And you might say, as it says in the books, that sometimes a man incarnates in the body of a pig. 
that he receives a desire and a craving to take livelihood from things that he already determined were litter, but now he again wants to revive himself in them. Now remember, all Kabbalistic books are written in language of branches. To reincarnate or to incarnate means to y use a particular desire, to identify with a particular need and a particular delight, that is, its filling. And in this case, it is the reason for something. So if a person incarnates in the body of a pig, that is to say, uh, it's a lower state than the state of a human. The desire is a desire for self-fulfillment on the simplest kind of level of self-satisfaction. And uh, the person already knows because of their goal that their goal is above the level of, of uh, animal desires, that it is a human desire, that what, of what a person is attempting to do is to develop a soul, which is the human level of spirituality. And, uh, and yet, he finds himself taking uh, sustenance from something that he already has determined is not his goal. Still, it's not the man who did this. The Creator hurled me down to a place of filth. We don't need to worry about these states. The only thing that we need to do is to relate them all to the Creator. That's where our ascent is. That's where the path towards uh, spirituality is, not in the externals. And also when a man feels that he's in a state of ascent and he tastes some good flavor in the work, he must not say, now I'm in a state where I understand that it is worthwhile to worship God. Rather, he should know that now the Lord fancied him. And for that reason, he draws him near, which is the reason why he tastes the good flavor in the work. And he should be careful never to leave the domain of holiness and say that there is another operating force besides the Creator.